So our next speakers are Akiba and Yacinta uh, Pusinski, and they're going to talk about a hyena ate my project, open hardware or open source hardware and wildlife conservation technology. So I'm going to let them uh, get started right now. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Jacinta, and I'm from Freak Labs. And I'm Akiva from Freak Labs. And in this talk, as um, as was just mentioned, we'll be talking about a hyena ate my project. And yes, that device really was eaten by a hyena. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about how we're using open source hardware to develop conservation technology. Um, first, though, a bit of background on us. Uh, so. When I was a young and experienced engineer, I thought I knew a lot more than I actually did. I also wanted to work on meaningful things that would impact the planet. At that time, I truly believed that technology could solve many of the problems in the world. And boy, was I wrong. <laughs> I also wanted to work on, on big issues that um, where I could make and have a meaningful impact. I also wanted to travel lots and see lots of beautiful and amazing places as well. So, <laughs> so Freak Labs was established in 2008 and has been in the open hardware community since it started. Um, and we still release our designs as open source. We specialize in wireless sensor networks and environmental monitoring in rural and remote areas. Um, so we work on international development projects for organizations such as UNESCO and World Bank. Some of the projects include things like monitoring potable water levels, preventing illegal dumping in the Nile, wirelessly monitoring rice paddy fields and so on. We've, we've worked in many parts of the world and in many different environments and climates from mountains in the Himalayas challenging environment to rainforests in Panama, deserts in Colombia, another challenging environment, and the savannas of the Serengeti. And after working up close and personal on all these projects, which are tackling big issues, um, we've come to appreciate how complex these problems really are and how technology, the technology we're asked to develop is often a small part of the total solution. And we've realized that often the technical development is the easiest part of the, of the problem to solve. Um, a good example of, of this is technology we developed to prevent illegal dumping of sewage into the Nile River. There's a whole host of reasons why this happens. And we um, developed a, a system that monitors the GPS location and the septage level of the trucks and would send an alert if the septage was being disposed of or the level was going down um, at a site that wasn't a designated site. So whilst the technology worked, it was only useful if the local officials acted upon the alerts they were receiving. Um, and so whilst the technology could help in one part of the problem, there needed to be and is um, people working towards the, the bigger social, political and economic solutions at all levels for this meaningful change to occur. And this can take a long time. So we were really lucky to have had the chance to work on the projects that we have. Um, it's given a lot of it's given us both a lot of perspective and humility in what technology can achieve and actually do and taught us to look at everything as a, as a complex system with often very subtle dynamics our first foray into open source um, conservation technology came through a, a rather unusual request to add audio playback to a camera trap so it would play predator sounds when triggered and therefore record the animal's fear response. We never thought we'd be developing or creating technology to scare the bejesus out of animals and then record them, but it was a fascinating project and it introduced us to the strange and wonderful applications that technology could be used for, as well as the strange and wonderful people involved in conservation. And conservation is also an area that tackles, again, really big complex problems um, where we can make a meaningful difference. So that, that was really exciting for us. The project was called Boombox, um, and we'll hear some of the responses that it, that it captured. Um, Eric, could you play the first clip? Are we back? Yeah. Okay. We're back. Yeah. Right. 
So, uh, so conservation technology is in a really exciting place right now. The use of technology is allowing us to gather more information than ever before, which can inform conservation and management practices. It's also enabling research methodologies that can help discover new findings and are less invasive and stressful on the animals. On the hardware side of things, there's camera traps, audio capture, drones, wireless, satellite, GPS, LiDAR, you name it. And there's a huge challenge in the data processing. Researchers are bringing in thousands of hours in video footage and bioacoustics data and millions of data points from animal trackers. Even Google and Microsoft are involved in the AI and machine learning challenges that data processing for wildlife conservation prevents. And actually, um, I think in two presentations down, uh, Edge Impulse will be talking about machine learning in, um, in wildlife conservation. Um, so, however, there are numerous challenges in technology for conservationists. The equipment is often very niche, industrial, or scientific grade, and hence uh, quite expensive. So, a typical wildlife tracker can range between uh, $1,000 to $5,000. Data loggers, uh, field recorders, over $1,000 each. On top of that, the devices often need to be highly customized for a very specific application, and only a few of them are needed. So this is, you know, I think a lot of you are manufacturers out there, and this is the worst case scenario. There are lots of individual researchers and conservationists or groups with small to mid budgets, but there's very little technology or few companies out there catering to them. Necessity is the mother of invention. And when you get a lot of highly intelligent people with scarce resources, they start solving their own problems. The wildlife community started using off-the-shelf trail cams designed for game hunters and modifying them as camera traps. This meant they could actually record animal behavior without humans being present and having the cameras operational all the time. A lot of organizations now manage networks of hundreds to thousands of camera traps to monitor animal populations and behavior. Open source hardware seems like a natural progression, especially in a funding constrained environment because it's naturally customizable, affordable, and community supported. It can utilize low cost commercial technology and chips and be customizable to specifically address the needs of wildlife and conservation. There's already some really good open source hardware out there like FieldKit, an open source modular data logger, and AudioMoth, an open source bioacoustic logger. And there's also many more areas and problems that open source hardware can contribute to solving. However, just being open source isn't enough. Rather than approaching it simply from a technology pers perspective, we wanted to look at it more holistically. What are the barriers to using open source conservation technology and how can we help solve it? For a start, having open source and schematics isn't useful if the conservationists and researchers don't have an engineering background or aren't comfortable with technology. What prevents a lot of people from building their own devices is the huge learning curve and also, and this is a big one, knowing where to start. There's a huge fragmentation in open source platforms where you have the Raspberry Pi, Arduino, ESP32, Microbit, Jetson, et cetera. This all leads to platform anxiety, even with people that are comfortable with technology. It's always a risk to invest time in a platform, and especially if you're not sure it can do what you need it to do. Many conservationists already have heavy demands on their time with research, grant writing, networking, and field work. Investing time in learning a platform becomes a significant risk and hence a deterrent for many conservationists. Also, there are specific requirements in conservation that don't exist in general or consumer technology. Conservation hardware, at least on the data acquisition side of things, needs to be field deployable. This means high reliability, low power, ruggedized, able to withstand extreme temperatures, and able to deal with special situations. Some examples are monkeys pulling out exposed cables, kangaroos and wombats chewing through wires, insects nesting inside exposed crevices, periodic floods, and a scene here getting eaten by hyenas. Amazingly, this device was still functional, although the enclosure had to be replaced. So when we um, started to develop open source technology for conservation, one of the big decisions we made was to standardize on a single platform, the classic Arduino platform. It's mature, it's reliable, it has excellent library support, and it's relatively easy to, to use for, for beginners. 
Um, we've had to make certain modifications to the devices that we designed, so they're Arduino compatible, um, so that and also so that they're able to be deployed. For example, we've added in power optimizations, um, but overall, the Arduino platform can do around eighty to ninety percent of what field researchers need. So the idea behind this is to reduce the technical decisions researchers need to make at the beginning so they can focus on building out their application as they start to learn and understand how um, the technology works and is put together. And from there, going, they can um, then go on to, to build out or to move across to other platforms as well. We've also focused on creating a lot of learning content catered specifically for wildlife and conservation deployments. Um, so as Akiva mentioned, sometimes there's some fun situations where you're dealing with animals. So we've focused on things like enclosures and, and ruggedizing the devices, but we've also um, focused on how to control sensors, how to optimize power consumption for longer battery life and therefore longer life in the field, and how to test and debug your devices so that, that you, you have more confidence that they're reliable um, and will actually get you the data that you need. Um, and we've, throughout this um, tool building, we've assumed no prior hardware experience. Um, the, the course we're working on at the moment is the Build Your Own Data Logger course, which is a collaboration with Wild Labs. It starts from scratch and we've added things like terminology sheets, live office hours and forums to help people throughout the course. It was supposed to be a five part video over two and a half months, but now it's a 14 part series with 36 videos and it's on its six month of development. Um, but we're hoping to create a body of work that people can then go back and refer to when and as they need to. Um, and we're already seeing some researchers customize the device and deploy it um, in streams to monitor water quality, as well as caves to monitor the people traffic through the caves. Uh, we're also um, focusing on working with um, cross-disciplinary teams um, to develop the hardware and exchange ideas on how um, technology can be used. So the Boombox was a project that came out of um, using an MP3 player in a toy, but we needed to um, have conversations at the beginning about what the real requirements were and and think laterally, I guess, about what we might be able to bring across into a conservation and wildlife context and into the field. It's really rewarding to work with subject matter experts and create technology in this way because we're developing technology and hardware that we would never ever have been able to develop or let alone deploy and see in the field um, on our own. The other important point for us is thinking how we can um, be creating a place and knowledge and experience and skills and thinking about diversity and inclusion from the start and what barriers people might be facing that we could help remove. Um, there's a few things that we, we try to do just along with bigger plans. There's also very small steps that we do, um, but they're just as important and it's, it's qu quite straightforward and simple, explaining jargon as it's being used, respectful interactions, um, you know, creating a safe space to ask questions so there's no stupid questions. You can literally say, does this red wire plug in here? Where does it go? That, that kind of thing. Um, so we're hoping that these efforts and the efforts of others in the conservation community will help create a next generation of wildlife and environmental conservationists that are proficient not only in their respective areas, but also in technology. They'll be able to take the available open source tools customize them to their needs and use them to make impactful findings that can improve our understanding of animals and the planet. So uh, thank, thanks everyone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's another, there's one more clip yeah. that we'd like to show you. So this one has the hyena that actually ate our device. And um, let's see, and there, uh, let's see, and a couple more too. <laughs> you get some strength. The elephant. <laughs> so, 
um, I I think that's our talk for today. I hope uh, like there's actually a lot of really exciting things happening in like both the wildlife conservation and environmental conservation communities, especially with uh, technology and open source hardware.